Don't know, should I use this? What should I use? Okay, I should, good. Good morning. I was looking at a weather report uh, in, back in Vancouver, and uh, my wife said, oh, it's gonna get cold next week. I said, oh, that's fine, I won't be there. <laughs> I'm leaving. So it's cold in Vancouver right now. I think it even got down to minus three or four. <laughs> So you'll have to you'll have to work with me because you know as a as a Vancouverite you know we don't know how to dress right for weather like this so I've got multiple layers on just in case and it's warm in here and it's cold out there but I'm delighted to be here uh, even with the the, uh, the cold weather and uh, it's a delight to be um, here as the scientist in residence uh, with you for the next few days and I hope we have some good conversations around these topics. I don't know if, if, if the students you know, here at CMU or anything like the students at Trinity Western, this is a topic that for some uh, can be quite an engaging and somewhat challenging topic to navigate. But it's also an interesting opportunity to learn more about your faith, to learn more about scripture, and to learn more about science. And there'll be some scientists in the crowd too. And uh, so this, it's a fun opportunity to talk about some really interesting biology as well. So I'm delighted. What we're going to do this morning, uh, just briefly, is just sort of prime the pump for a couple of these questions that we'll be dealing with over the week. There's a lot to talk about, and we'll have, some, have a chance uh, over the next couple of days to sort of engage those issues more deeply. But what I thought we'd do this morning is just kind of briefly sort of set the stage for some of these conversations. Although I will say as an aside, you do have to come back for tomorrow for chapel because you'll get to see me try to lead some worship songs. So if you want to see amateur hour of a scientist on a guitar, then you need to come back tomorrow. <laughs> so this is a book I had, a privilege to, had the privilege to write with theologian Scott McKnight a couple of years ago. It's been out for a, a bit now and it's gotten um, some positive responses. It's gotten some negative responses and it puts some things on the table that we can talk about. The first one, as a biologist, that um, I sort of talk about with my students is this idea of evolution as a scientific theory. So one of the challenges with the word theory is that we use it in common everyday English in ways that a scientist wouldn't use it. So if you're on Facebook, I know that kind of dates me, right? I'm an old person, I use Facebook. If you're on Facebook and you see somebody saying, well, okay, that's your theory, Right, what they're saying is that's your guess, that's your conjecture, it's your just kind of idea without much supporting evidence. But in science, a theory is actually quite a different entity. In, in science, a theory is a broad explanatory framework that's been subject to a lot of experimentation. We use it to make predictions about the natural world. We go and test those predictions to see if they hold up. And one of the things that's sometimes challenging for my students to find out especially in the first year or so, is that evolution is actually a theory in the scientific sense. It's a broad explanatory framework. We've been working on it for 150 years. It has not yet been falsified. We provisionally always sort of hold that it could potentially be changed as we learn more about the natural world. So one of the things that students kind of wrestle with is this first sort of challenging issue is that, okay, evolution is something that is, at least in the scientific community, a well-accepted explanation for why the facts are the way they are. And if you're like me, I grew up in an evangelical setting, and I grew up going to Sunday school from a young age, and one of the things I learned, sort of by osmosis, very early on, was that evolution was kind of a bad word. You know, I'd hear the word Darwin, I'd hear the word evolution, and it was like hearing somebody swear. It's like, those are bad things, you don't talk about those things. Because evolution is a way to try to explain away creation. It's a way to try to explain the origins of humanity in a way that excludes God. And that was kind of my experience growing up. And as I was sharing with uh, some of your professors over coffee this morning, I actually went through my entire PhD, my bachelor's and my PhD, uh, holding to an anti-evolutionary perspective, which is kind of interesting to do within, you know, within a biology PhD. And it wasn't until afterwards that I actually started looking into, is evolution something that potentially could be compatible with Christian faith? What is the evidence for evolution actually like? And so on. Anyway, we'll talk more about that in later talks. So I'm gonna give you a summary now. So okay, there's evolution, is a, well exp is a well tested explanatory framework in the, in the sciences as a scientific theory. 
Evolution also says a couple of things in the present day that are commonly thought to be pretty challenging with respect to Christian belief. And the two things that are kind of primarily on the radar for biologists and, and for Christians in this area of potential conflict between Christianity and science are these. The first is, is that the evidence very, very strongly supports that humans are actually the product of an evolutionary process, that not only have other organisms on the planet been subject to this process of evolution, but that humans are also part of that as well. So what do we do with that? The next one is that, was actually something that I found out was potentially actually even more challenging to some people. Some people are actually okay with evolution of a sort within a Christian framework, but this particular point actually became more challenging to them. That not only that humans have come about through an evolutionary process, but also that as we did so, we did so as a fairly large population. So at no point in our history is there any evidence for a population size that numbers below about 10,000-ish or so. So these are things that sort of, you know, if, you, if you're like me and you grew up in Sunday school, right? Now I'll really date myself, but do you know what a flannel graph is? <laughs> okay, that was, interna that was interactive technology back when I was a kid in Sunday school, right? My flannel graph didn't have 10,000 people on it, right? My flannel graph had Adam and Eve on it, right? So that was the, the narrative that I grew up hearing, and that was my understanding of how God created, that God supernaturally created two people in a garden, and that all humans had descended from them. So this is the other sort of issue that has kind of come onto the evangelical radar in the last couple of years, that population genetics is very strongly suggesting and supporting the hypothesis that we arose not only through an evolutionary process, but also as a substantial population. So these things can be kind of unsettling as Christians. One of the things I enjoy about teaching my students at Trinity Western is that we get the enjoyment of wrestling with these questions. I sometimes say to my students, you're at a time in the history of the church where there's actually this dialogue going on where there's a perceived tension between the findings of science and what the church over its history has held to. I said, we haven't actually had that happen for about 400 years. And some of you would think back, okay, 400 years ago, thinking about the sort of Galileo heliocentrism, geocentrism discussion. And I say to my students, you know, you're lucky. You get to live in a time when the church is actually wrestling through one of these issues. It's been about 400 years. And my students say, I don't want to be in one of those times, <laughs> right? I just want to be in a time when it's all sorted out. And we don't lose any sleep over the geocentrism, heliocentrism discussion anymore. None of you, none of us grew up in the church wondering about, you know, is the sun the center of our solar system or is the earth the immobile center of our system? None of us grew up in the church wondering about how those things fit within Christianity because we were never presented those texts from the Bible as somehow in opposition to the science that we were learning. We didn't learn the story, we didn't learn narratives from scripture and then get taught, you know, that the sun is the center of our solar system and we didn't feel that those two were in conflict. When our young kids were in um, preschool, they went to a very academic preschool. It was kind of embarrassingly so academic. But anyway, they were learning stuff that what I was just amazed by. They had this whole little science seg segment, and they had this CD that they brought home, and it had this really cute little song in it about how our solar system was constructed. And the irony is, is that the thing that they were learning about in preschool would have been absolutely heretical you know, 500 years ago in the church. But we just, now it's, now it's something that's so inco inconsequential to our faith that this is a, pr a Christian preschool and they're presenting this as part of God's wonderful creation. And it's interesting, you know, how much, you know, what a difference 400 years makes. So I say to my students, you're lucky you get to be a part of this conversation. This is something that you actually get to engage in. So a couple of things to keep in mind, you know, how do we proceed? We're in this interesting scenario where Science seems to be saying something that doesn't sit easily well with what we've learned about as Christians. What should we keep in mind? How do we proceed on these questions? So, a couple of things to keep in mind. First off, I sometimes make this clear to my students. 
I'll say one of the things that everybody agrees on, regardless of the perspective that they take, and there's a range of Christian perspectives on this topic, one of the things that everybody agrees on is that it's not a salvation issue. And this actually can be pretty freeing for some of my students. They realize that this isn't a make or break issue for their faith. This isn't something that if they get this wrong, that somehow this means that they're stepping outside of Orthodox Christianity. Christians historically have said that God is the creator, but what Christians have not said historically is that, God, that the Christians haven't specified a particular means of creation. So we have that latitude within the church, and we've had it ever since our beginning, to be able to say, yes, we affirm God as the creator of heaven and earth, just like the creeds say, but at that point, we're also welcomed by God to use the tools of science to try to figure out exactly how that creation took place. So it's not a salvation issue. There's some freedom here. Even you know Christians all along the spectrum, from young earth creationists to old earth creationists to evolutionary creationists, they all agree that it's not a make or break issue. It's something that isn't going to threaten your faith necessarily. This is something that we're actually going to explore a little bit more in the chapel time uh, tomorrow. And it's part of the reason why you're going to get me doing amateur hour with the guitar, because it's going to be hard to do a talk about how Christians have incorporated science into their worship over the centuries. It just seems a little odd to me to do a talk, an academic talk about that, and not actually sing some of those songs that show how Christians have been incorporating science into their worship. So that's why I joke and say, you got to come back tomorrow and see the amateur hour guitar thing, right? Christians actually have a long history of looking at the natural world, understanding it as God's creation, and then praising him for it. That goes right back to the Psalms and the early church. There's lots of good examples of that. The idea is, is that we have this long history, and should we now be at a point where we should stop that practice would be sort of the question. So if Christians have been doing this for a really long time, and like I said, there's those, that CD that my kids' preschool had, right? That was a song that was praising God for the wonders of his heliocentric solar system as part of his creation. So Christians have long been taking scientific knowledge, and then as we learn more about God's creation through science, they've been returning that to God in, the, in praise. We've been praising him for the things that we've learned about his creation. Now, some of you might be familiar with the um, Hillsong song, A Hundred Billion Times. Some of you have heard that. I used to say to my students years ago, I said, you know, sooner or later, Christians have this habit of taking things that they've learned about nature and putting it into worship songs. I said, sooner, and I, you know, this is me being really edgy a couple of years ago, saying, you know, sooner or later, there's going to be a Christian worship song that actually has the word evolution in it. You've got to wait for it. Now, I didn't think it would happen as quickly as it did. But there it is, we've got the first one. And I don't think it'll be the last one. And I know that there's been some controversy around that song. Some churches are saying, you know, should I sing this or not? Other churches are saying, okay, we'll change that one word to something else. But for better or for worse, we now have our first Christian song, Christian worship song that has the word evolution in it and is praising God for creatures evolving in response to what God is commanding. So Christians have this long history of taking scientific knowledge and then returning praise to God for that knowledge that we have. Okay, another thing to keep in mind. Humility is really important. None of us have a complete understanding of scripture, of science, of how those things necessarily fit together. So whatever position one takes, it's always a good idea to remain humble, to know that we don't necessarily have all the answers, and to allow space for other people, for others in our congregations and in our fellowship to have maybe a different view on things. When I first joined the church that I'm attending now, I was actually a little bit concerned because I didn't know the pastor and I didn't know the congregation. So we'd gone there for a Sunday or two. My kids were starting to kind of like the place. And it's, so I was talking my, with my wife and it was like, yeah, we're, you know, this might be a place that we might come back to again a couple of times. This might end up being our home church. So I pulled the pastor aside and I said, sooner or later you're going to hear a few things about me 
and I'd rather you just heard about them from me directly. And I explained who I was and the work I did with the BioLogos Foundation, which is an organization that promotes evolutionary creation. And I said, is this gonna be a problem? Would you rather that I just take my family and keep looking at other churches? Because I don't wanna disrupt your congregation. I don't know what the range of views might be. And he said, no, you're welcome here. He said, there's a range of positions here in this church. Some people um, are young earth creationists, other people are old earth creationists, some people um, are evolutionary creationists like you. He said, as long as you're willing to be charitable to everyone that's here, and as long as you're willing to lovingly dialogue with everybody, then you're, there's a place for you here. And I thought that was a very good point. I said, and of course, that's exactly what I would want to do. And part of that flows out of our humility that we see in part, we know in part, and we might be wrong on some of these things. But the most important thing is that we have the love and Christian fellowship that we see that as more important than our particular position on origins. So humility goes a long way. Here's the, the last point. Sometimes my students have this feeling that if they're somehow struggling with these issues or if they're curious about these issues, or if they have questions about these issues, that somehow that might mean that their relationship with God is somehow going to be threatened by that. And one of the things that I like to try to tell my students is that if you've ever read the Psalms, you know that God is perfectly fine with questions, right? And David has asked some questions in some of those Psalms that are harder questions than any of us probably have asked, or I've, harder than I've ever asked. So the point here is that God is interested in you learning more about him, learning more about scripture, learning about more about the world that he's created, and he's not afraid of you finding out more about it or asking him tough questions about it. I would actually argue that he delights in it, that he likes it when we engage with him. I think God would be more concerned if you were kind of just checked out and just kind of going through the motions. So if this is an issue that you're interested in working through, and I recognize it won't be for everybody, some of us, you know, we're okay with the science side of things and maybe we're struggling with something else right now. But for some of us, it might be something that you are wrestling with. And if that's you, I'm thoroughly convinced that God is happy for you to be wrestling with that and God is excited that this might be something that might deepen your relationship with him as you struggle with this. Regardless of what position you come to, that God is interested in you engaging with him and wrestling through these questions, I think God likes that. I think that's kind of why he made scientists, right? We're, we're people that like to wrestle with these sorts of issues. I mean, God made us all, right? Different kinds of people and different kinds of personalities. But I think God likes it when we wrestle through these questions. So that's what I sort of see as kind of setting a little bit of sort of context for the conversations that we're going to have this week. I hope everybody feels that it's a safe place to ask whatever questions they want. Trust me, you are not gonna ask me questions that are gonna make me upset or make me concerned. I've heard it from you know, my students that have been working through these issues for many years. So I hope you feel safe to ask whatever questions you want through the week. And uh, yeah, at this point I think the idea is that there's opportunity for some of you perhaps to ask questions now. So do I just moderate that? I'm good with that. Is anybody brave enough that they have a question that they want to ask?